I'm excited to introduce our first speaker, uh, Arthur from Mistral. Uh, Arthur is the founder and CEO of Mistral AI, despite just being nine months old as a company uh, and having many fewer resources than some of the large foundation model companies so far. I think they've really shocked everybody by putting out incredibly high quality models approaching GPT-4 and Caliber uh, out into the open. So we're thrilled to have Arthur with us today, um, all the way from France, to share more about the opportunity behind building an open source. Um, and please, uh, in, in interviewing Arthur will be my partner, Matt Miller, who is dressed in his best French wear to, to honor Arthur today um, and, and, and helps lead, lead our efforts in Europe. So please welcome Matt and Arthur. With all the efficiency of a of a French train, right? Just 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 right on time. Just, yeah. Right on time. We were sweating a little bit back there because just 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 walked in the door. Um, but good to see you. Thanks for thanks for coming all this way. Thanks for being with us here at AISN today. Thank you for hosting us. Yeah, absolutely. Would love to maybe start with the background story of, you know, why you why you chose to start Mistral and and maybe just take us to the beginning. You know, you we all know about your career at Deep, your successful career at DeepMind, your work on the Chinchilla paper. Um, but tell us, maybe share with us, we always love to hear at Sequoia, and I know that our founder community also loves to hear that spark that like gave you the idea to, to launch and to, to start to break out and start your own company. Yeah, sure. Um, so we started the company in April, but I guess the idea was uh, out there for a couple of months before. Uh, Timothée and I were in master together, Guillaume and I were in school together, so we knew each other from before, and we had been in the field for like 10 years uh, doing research. Uh, and so we loved the way uh, AI progressed because of uh, the open exchanges that occurred between uh, academic labs, uh, industrial labs, uh, and how everybody was able to build on, on, on top of uh, one another. And it was still the case, I guess, when uh, in between, even in the beginning of the LLM era, we, where uh, OpenAI and DeepMind were actually uh, like, uh, contributing to another, uh, one another roadmap. And this kind of stopped uh, in 2022. Uh, so basically, the, one of the last uh, paper doing important changes to the way we train models was Chinchilla. And that was the last model that uh, Google ever published, uh, last important model in the field that Google published. And so for us, it was a bit of a shame that uh, we stopped, uh, that the field stopped doing uh, open, uh, open contributions that early in the AI journey because we were very far away from uh, finishing it. Uh, and so when we saw ChatGPT at the, at the end of the year, and, um, and I think we reflected on the fact that there was some opportunity for doing things differently, for doing things from uh, France, because in France you have, uh, as it turned out, there was a lot of uh, talented people that were a bit bored at, uh, in big tech companies. Mm -hmm. And so that's how we figured out that there was an opportunity for building uh, very strong open source models, going very fast with a lean team uh, of experienced people. Uh, and show, yeah, and try to correct the, the the direction that the field was taking. So we wanted to push it to push the open source models much more. And I think we did a good job at that because we've been followed by uh, various companies uh, in our uh, trajectory. Wonderful. And so it was really a lot of the open source move movement was a lot of the a lot of the drive behind starting the company. Yeah, that's one of one of the yeah that was one of the driver. Uh, our intention and the mission that we gave ourselves is really to bring AI to the hands of every developers, mm -hmm. and the way it was done and the way it is still done by our competitors is very closed. Uh, and so we want to push a much more open platform, and we want to spread the adoption and accelerate the adoption uh, through that uh, strategy. So that's very much uh, at the core. Well, the reason why we started the company, indeed. Wonderful. And, you know, just recently, I mean, fast forward to today, you released Mistral Large. You've been on this tear of like amazing partnerships with Microsoft, Snowflake, Databricks announcements. And so how do you balance the what you're going to do open source with what you're going to do commercially and how you're going to think about the the trade off? Because that's something that, you know, many open source companies contend with. You know, how do they keep their community thriving? But then how do they also build a successful business to contribute to their community? Yeah, it's, it's a hard question, and the way we've addressed it is currently through uh, two families of model, but this might evolve with time. Um, we intend to stay the leader in open source, so that kind of puts a pressure on, on the open source uh, mm -hmm. family because there's obviously some contenders out there. Um, the, I think compared to how 
various software providers playing this strategy uh, developed, we need to go faster. Uh, because AI develops actually faster than software, develops yeah. faster than databases. Like MongoDB played a very good game at that, and this is a good uh, a good example of what we could do. Uh, but we need to adapt faster. So yeah, uh, yeah. There's obviously this tension, and we are constantly thinking on how we should contribute to the community, but also how we should uh, show and start uh, getting some commercial adoption, uh, enterprise uh, deals, etc. And this is uh, there's obviously a tension and. For now, I think we've done a good job at, at doing it, but it's it's very it's a very dynamic thing to to think through. So it's basically every week we think of uh, what we should release next on the on both families. And you have been the fastest uh, in developing models, fastest reaching different benchmarking levels. M you know, one of the most leanest in amount of expenditure to reach these benchmarks out of any of the comp any of the foundational model companies. What do you think is like giving you that advantage to move quicker than your predecessors? And more efficiently, I think we like to do uh, the like uh, get our hands dirty. Uh, it's uh, machine learning has always been about uh, crunching numbers, uh, looking at your data, uh, doing a lot of uh, extract, transform, and load, and things that are uh, oftentimes not fascinating. And yeah. so we hired people that uh, were willing to do the dirty stuff, uh, and I think that's. Uh, uh, that has been uh, critical to our speed, and yep. that's something that we want to to keep. Yeah. Awesome. And the in addition to the large model, you also have several small models that are extremely popular. When would you tell people that they should spend their time working with you on the small models? When would you tell them working on the large models? And where do you think the economic opportunity for Mistral lies? Is it in doing more of the big or doing more of the small? I think, and I think this is a. Um, this is an observation that uh, every LLM provider has made uh, in that like one size does not fit all and uh, depending on what you want to when you make an application you typically have different large language model calls uh -huh. and some should be low latency and because they don't require a lot of intelligence but some should be higher latency and require more intelligence and an efficient application should leverage both of them potentially using the large models as an, or as an orchestrator for the small ones mm -hmm. um, and I think the challenge here is how do you make sure that everything works? So you end up with like a system that is not only a model, but it's really like two models plus an outer loop of, um, of calling your model, calling systems, calling mm -hmm. functions. And I think some of the developer challenge that we also want to address is how do you make sure that this works, that, that you can evaluate it properly? How do you make sure that you can do continuous integration? How do you, how do you change like one, how do you move from one version to another of a model and make sure that your application has actually improved? and not deteriorated. So all of these things are addressed by various companies, uh, but these are also things that we think should be core to our value proposition. And what are some of the most exciting things you see being built on Mistral? Like what are the things that you get really excited about that you see the community doing or customers doing? I think pretty much uh, every young startup uh, in the Bay Area has been using it for yeah. like fine-tuning pur fine purposes for fast application making. Uh, so really, I think one part of the value of Mixtral, for instance, is that it's very fast, and so you can make applications that uh, are more involved. Uh, and so we've seen uh, we've seen web search companies using us. Uh, we've seen uh, I mean all, all of the standard enterprise stuff as well, like uh, knowledge management, uh, marketing. Uh, the fact that you have access to the weights means that you can pour in your editorial tone much more. Yeah. Uh, so that's yeah. We we see the typical use cases. I think the the but the value is that uh, for the open source part is that uh, developers have control, so they can deploy it everywhere. They can have very high quality of service because they can uh, use their dedicated instances, for instance, and they can modify the weights to suit their needs and to bump the performance to a level which is close to the largest ones, the largest models, while being much cheaper. And what what's the next big thing do you think that we're going to get to see from you guys? Like, can you give us a sneak peek of what might be coming soon, or how what we should be expecting from Mistral? Yeah, for sure. So we have uh, so Mistral Large was uh, good, but not good enough. So we are working on improving it quite uh -huh. quite heavily. Uh, we have uh, interesting open source models uh, on various uh, vertical domains uh, yeah. that uh, we'll be announcing very soon. Um, we have uh, the platform is currently just APIs, like uh, serverless APIs, uh, and so we are working on making customization part of it, so mm -hmm. really like the fine tuning part. Um, and obviously, and I think as many other companies, we we are heavily betting on multilingual uh, data and, and multilingual model uh, because 
as a European company, we're also well positioned. And this is the demand of our customers uh, that I think is higher than uh, here. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, eventually uh, in the months to come, we, are, we will also release some uh, multimodal models. Okay, exciting. We'll, we'll look forward to that. Um, as you mentioned, many of the people in this room are using Mistral models. Many of the companies we work with every day here in the Silicon Valley ecosystem are working already working with Mistral. How should they work with you and how should they work with the company and what, what type of, what's the best way for them to work with you? Well, well, they can reach out. So we have uh, some developer relations that are really uh, like pushing the community forward, making guides, uh, also gathering use cases uh, to showcase what you can build uh, mm -hmm. with Mistral model. So this is we're very uh, like investing a lot on the community. Um, something that basically makes the model better uh, and that we are trying to set up is our ways to for us to get evaluations, benchmarks, actual use cases on which we can evaluate our models on. And so having like a mapping of what people are building with our model is also a way for us to make a better generation of yeah. uh, new open source models. And so please engage with us to uh, discuss how we can help, uh, how discuss your use cases, we can advertise it. Uh, we can uh, also gather some insight of, of the new evaluations that we should add to our evaluation suit to verify that our models get, are getting better over time. Mm -hmm. And on the commercial side, uh, our models are available on our platform. So the commercial models are actually working better than, uh, than the, um, the open source ones. They're also available on various cloud providers so that it facilitates uh, adoption for enterprises. Um, and customization capabilities like fine tuning, which really made the value of the open source models are actually coming very soon. Wonderful. And you talked a little bit about the benefits of being in Europe. You touched on it briefly. You're already this example, global example of the great innovations that can come from Europe and are coming from Europe. What you know, talk a little bit more about the advantages of building a business from France and like building this company from Europe. The advantage and drawbacks, I guess. Uh, yeah, both. Both. Yeah. I guess what, one advantage is that uh, you have a very strong junior pool of talent. Uh, so we, there's a lot of uh, people coming from uh, masters in France, in Poland, in the UK, uh, that we can train in like three months and get them up to speed, mm -hmm. get, get them basically producing as much as a, as, as a million uh, dollar engineer uh, in the Bay Area uh, for 10 times, 10, 10 times less the cost. So that's, that's kind of efficient. Shh, uh, don't tell them all that. <laughs> They're going to hire people in France. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, so <laughs> they, like the, the workforce is very good, uh, yeah. engineers and, uh, and machine learning engineers. Um, generally speaking, we have a lot of support from uh, like the state, which is actually more important in Europe than in, in the US. They tend to over-regulate a, uh, a bit too fast. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've been telling them not to, but uh, they don't always listen. Uh, and then generally, uh, I mean, yeah, like European companies like to work with us because we are European and we're, we are better in uh, European languages, as it turns out, like French. Uh, the, the French Mistral Large is actually probably the strongest French uh, model out there. Uh, so no surprise. yeah, that's, uh, I guess that's not an advantage, but uh, at least there's a lot of opportunities that are geographical and that we're leveraging. Wonderful. And, you know, paint the picture for us five years from now. Like, I know that this world's moving so fast. You just think like all the things you've gone through in the two years. It's not even two years old as a company. It's almost two years old as a company. Um, but, but, Five years from now, where does Mistral sit? What do you think you have achieved? Where, what does this landscape look like? So our bet is that uh, basically the platform and the infrastructure uh, of, intelli of artificial intelligence will be open. Yeah. And based on that, uh, we'll be able to create uh, assistance and then potentially autonomous agent. And we believe that we can become this platform uh, by being the most open platform out there, by being independent from cloud providers, etc. So. In five years from now, I have literally no idea of what this is going to look like. If you were, if you looked at the field in like 2019, I don't think you could bet on uh, where we would be today. But we are evolving toward more and more autonomous agents. We can do more and more tasks. Mm -hmm. I think the way we work is going to be changed profoundly. And making such uh, agents and assistants uh, is going to be easier and easier. So right now we're focusing on the developer world, but uh, I expect that like AI technology is in itself. Uh, so uh, easily controllable through human languages, human language that potentially at, at some point the developer becomes a user. And so we are evolving toward uh, any user uh, being able to create its own assistant or its own mm -hmm. autonomous agent. I'm pretty sure that in five years from now, this will be 
uh, like something that you learn to do at school. Awesome. Well, we have about five minutes left. Just want to open up in case there's any questions from the audience. Don't be shy. Sonia's got a question. How do you see the future of open source versus commercial models playing out for your company? Like, I think you made a huge splash with open source at first. As you mentioned, some of the commercial models are even better now. How, how do you imagine that plays out over the next handful of years? Well, I guess the, the one thing we optimize for is to be able to continuously produce open models uh, with a sustainable business model to actually uh, uh, like fuel the development of the next generation. Uh, and so that's... I think that, as I've said, this is uh, this is going to evolve with time. But in order to stay relevant, we need to stay uh, the best at producing open source models, uh, at least on some part of the spectrum. So that can be the small models, that can be the very big models, uh, and so that's very much something that basically that sets the constraints on whatever we can say we can do, uh, staying relevant in the open source uh, world, staying the best uh, solution for developers is really our mission, and, and we'll keep doing it. David. There's got to be questions for more than just the Sequoia partners, guys. Come on. <laughs> you talked to us a little bit about uh, Llama 3 and Facebook and how you think about competition with them. Well, Llama 3 is working on, the, I guess, uh, making models. I'm not sure they will be open source. I have no idea of what's going on there. Uh, so far, I think we've been uh, delivering faster and smaller models. So we expect to be continuing doing it. But uh, generally, the, the good thing about open source is that it's never too much of a competition because... Uh, uh, once you have like, uh, if you have several actors, normally that should actually benefit to everybody. Uh, and so there should be some, if, if they turn out to be very strong, there will be some cross pollination and, and we'll welcome it. One thing that's uh, made you guys different from other proprietary model providers is the partnerships with uh, Snowflakes and Databricks, for example, and running natively in their clouds as opposed to sort of just having API connectivity. Um, curious if you can talk about why you did those deals, and then also what you see as the future of, say, Databricks or Snowflake in the brave new LLM world. I guess you should ask them, but uh, I think generally speaking, AI models become very strong if they are connected to data and grounding, uh, yeah, grounding information. As it turns out, uh, the enterprise data is oftentimes either on Snowflake or on Databricks or sometimes on AWS. Uh, and so being able for customers for customers to be able to deploy the technology exactly where their data is, uh, is I think quite important. I expect that this will continue, continue doing the do, being the case, uh, especially as I believe we'll move on to more stateful AI deployment. So today we deploy serverless APIs with not much state, it's really like Lambda, uh, Lambda functions. But as we go forward and as we make models more and more specialized, as we make them uh, more tuned to use cases, and as we make them um, self-improving, you will have to manage state, and those could actually be part of the data cloud. Or so there's there's an open question of where do you put the AI state, and I think that's uh, uh, my understanding is that Snowflake and Databricks would like it to be uh, on their data cloud. And I think there's a question right behind him, the gray switch. I'm curious where you draw the line between uh, openness and proprietary. So you, you're releasing the weights. Would you also be comfortable sharing more about how you train the models, the recipe for how you collect the data, how you do mixture of experts training, or do you draw the line at like we release the weights and the rest is proprietary? So that's where we draw the line. And I think the, the reason for that is that it's a very competitive landscape. Uh, and so it's... Uh, Similar to like the tension there is in between having uh, some form of revenue to sustain the next generation, and there's also a tension between uh, what you actually disclose and and everything that yeah in order to stay ahead of uh, of the curve and not to give your recipe to your competitors. Uh, and so again, this is this is the moving line. Uh, if there's also some some game theory at, at stake, like if everybody starts doing it, then then we could do it. Uh, but for now, uh, for now, we are not taking this risk indeed. I'm curious when an, when another company releases weights for a model like Grok, for example, um, and you only see the weights, what, what kinds of practices do you guys do internally to see what you can learn from it? You can't learn a lot of things from weights. Uh, we don't even look at it. It's actually too big for us to deploy. Uh, Grok is, is quite big. Or uh, was, was there any architecture learning? I guess they have. They are using like a mixture of expert, uh, pretty standard setting, uh, with a couple of tricks uh, 
that I knew about actually. But uh, yeah, that's uh, uh, there's there's not not a lot of things to learn from the recipe themselves by looking at the weights. You can try to infer things, but that's like reverse engineering is not that easy. Uh, it's basically compressing information and it compresses information sufficiently highly so that you you can't really find out what's going on. The cube is coming. Okay, it's okay. Uh, yeah, I'm just curious about like, um, what are you guys going to focus on uh, the model sizes? Your opinion is on that. Is like you guys going to still go on the small or uh, yeah, going to go to the larger ones basically? So model size are kind of set uh, by like scaling laws. So it depends on like the compute you have, based on the compute you have, based on the, the lending infrastructure you want to go to, you make some choices. Uh, and so you optimize for training cost and for inference cost. And then there's obviously, um, uh, there's the weight in between, uh, like for, uh, depends on the weight that you put on the training cost amortization. Uh, the more you amortize it, the, the more you can compress models. Uh, but basically our goal is to be uh, low latency and to be uh, relevant on the reasoning front. So that means having a family of models that goes from the small ones to the very large ones. Um, hi, are there any plans for Mistral to exp expand into uh, you know, the application stack? So for example, OpenAI released uh, the custom GPTs and the assistance API, is that the direction that you think that Mistral will take in the future? Uh, yeah, so I think as I've said, um, we are really focusing on the developer first, uh, but there's many, um, like the, the frontier is pretty thin in between developers and users for this technology. And so that's the reason why we released uh, like a, an assistant demonstrator called Le Chat, which is the cat in English. And uh, it's, uh, the point here is to expose it to enterprises as well and be, make them able to connect their data, connect their context. Um, I think that's, that, that answers some, some need from our customers that many of, of the people we've been talking to uh, are willing to adopt the technology, but they need an entry point. And so if you just give them APIs, they're going to say, okay, but uh, I need an integrator. And then you, if you don't have an integrator at end, and oftentimes this is the case, uh, it's good if you have like an off-the-shelf solution, at least to get them into the technology and show them what they could build for their core business. So that's the reason why we now have like two product offerings. There's the first one, which is the platform, and then we have Le Chat, uh, which should evolve into an enterprise off-the-shelf solution. More over there, more there. I'm just wondering, like, where would you be drawing the line between, like, stop doing prompt engineering and start doing, like, fine tuning? Because, like, a lot of my friends and our customers are suffering from, like, where they should be stopped doing more prompt engineering. Yeah, I think that's that's the number one pain point uh, that uh, is hard to solve uh, from from a product product standpoint. Uh, the question is, normally your workflow should be what should you evaluate on, and based on that, uh, have your model kind of find out a way of uh, solving your task. Uh, and so right now this is still a bit manual. You, you go and, and you have like several versions of prompting, uh, but this is something that actually AI can, can help solving. Uh, and I expect that this is going to grow more and more automatic across time. Uh, and this is something that, yeah, we'd love to try and enable. I wanted to ask a bit more of a personal question. So like as a founder in the cutting edge of AI, how do you balance your time between explore and exploit? Like, how do you yourself stay on top of like a field that's rapidly evolving and becoming larger and deeper every day? How do you stay on top? So I think this question has, um, I mean, we explore on the science part, on the product part, and on the business part. Uh, and the way you balance it is uh, is effectively hard. For a startup, you do have to exploit a lot because you, you need to ship fast. Uh, but on the science part, for instance, we have like two or three people that are like working on the next generation of models. And sometimes they lose time, but if you don't do that, you are at risk of becoming irrelevant. And this is very true for the product side uh, as well. So being right now we have a very simple product, but being able to try out new features and see how they pick up is something that we, we, are, we need to do. And on the business part, you never know who is actually quite mature enough to, to use your technology. So yeah, the, the balance between uh, exploitation and exploration is something that we master well uh, at the science level because we've been doing it for years. Uh, and somehow it transcribes into the product and the business, but uh, I guess we're currently uh, still learning to do it properly. 
So one more question for me, and then I think we'll be we'll be done. We're out of time, but you know, you in, in the scope of two years, models big, models small that have like taken the world by storm, killer go to market partnerships, you know, just tremendous momentum at the center of the AI ecosystem. What advice would you give to founders here? Like what you have achieved and the pace at which you have achieved is truly extraordinary. In what advice would you give to people here who are at different levels of starting and running and building their own businesses and around the AI opportunity? I would say it's uh, it's always day one. So I guess we, yeah, we are, uh, I mean, we got some mind share, but there's, I mean, there's still many proof points that we need to establish. Uh, and so, yeah, like being a founder is basically waking up every day and, and figuring out that uh, you need to build everything from scratch every time, well, all the time. So, it's a, uh, it's I guess a bit exhausting, but it's also exhilarating. Uh, and so I would recommend to be quite ambitious. Usually, uh, being more ambitious, uh, I mean, uh, ambition can get you very far. Uh, and so you, yeah, you should uh, dream big. Uh, that's uh, that. That would be my advice. Awesome. Thank you, Arthur. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you.